Kathleen should be live. Uh, thank you for joining us in another one of our SASA Savings and Studies Alliance live streams, a book club with live author Q&A. Uh, this month, we'll be talking about the book Cleopatra's Daughter by author Jane Draycott, who is joining us. And my name is Cassandra. I'm your SASA host. Just a little bit of business to get us started first. Let me do... Uh, Okay, what is SASA, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance? Now, our mission is to reverse the current downward trend in the study of the ancient world by engaging the public and bringing together students and scholars to share their passion for the study of the ancient world in order to inspire a vast new generation of students. Uh, you can find us on all of your major social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, LinkedIn, TikTok even. Our live event protocol, we just ask that you please be kind and respect, respectful, listen and ask thoughtful questions throughout the event. And please be patient with technology and those administering it. Our live events are live streamed on Twitch, YouTube and Facebook. They'll also be recorded and archived. They'll be posted on the above platform shortly after the event. And lastly, let's have fun. Little bit of SASA plug here, our virtual conference is coming up July 23rd through July 24th. Uh, register now if you're interested. You can go to our website, saveancientstudies.org slash virtual conference to learn more. Uh, it is completely free uh, and it's going to have a ton of interesting presentations. And please do become a recurring donor if you enjoy our live events, our book clubs, reading groups, Archeo Gaming. Uh, please consider becoming a supporter with a recurring monthly donation. You can just hit the little QR code up there in the corner and it'll take you straight to the website. For as little as $3 a month, you can help us save ancient studies. And thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn that off now. And pull this up. So this month we're featuring, uh, just learned this weekend's New York Times Editor's Choice, uh, Cleopatra's Daughter by Dr. Jane Draycott. Dr. Draycott holds a PhD in classics from the University of Nottingham. And following the completion of her doctorate, she was awarded two postdoctoral fellowships, Rome Fellow at the British School uh, at Rome and Lord Kelvin Adam Smith Research Fellow in Classics at the University of Glasgow. Over the last decade, she's worked in academic institutions in the UK and Italy, excavated sites ranging from Bronze Age, vi age villages to First World War trenches across the UK and Europe. Currently lecturer in ancient history at the University of Glasgow and co-directory director of the University of Glasgow's Games and Gaming Lab. Uh, we're honored to have her on today. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about yourself, Dr. Dracut? Oh, I think that just about covers it, actually. Those, <laughs> those, are, the, those are the sort of edited highlights. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, great. Okay, so Cleopatra's daughter. Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting read about someone that we don't hear a lot about necessarily in ancient history. Uh, why did you choose to highlight Cleopatra, Celine? Well, I suppose it was it was for that reason, really, that that uh, for a long time, I mean, because I, I did my PhD on Greco-Roman Egypt, and and so if you if you do Greco-Roman Egypt, you can't really avoid. Cleopatra, Cleopatra the seventh, uh, the last queen of Egypt. And I was never particularly interested with, with Cleopatra. I, I, I sort of, I found it quite off-putting actually, because it's it's just such a, an obvious sort of cliche kind of, of topic. You know, you sort of think, oh, what, what, what new is there to say about that? And well, as I, as I was sort of, you know, just, just, researching i realized that there was something new to say and it wasn't about cleopatra herself it was about the fact that she had children she had i mean everyone knows that she had a son with julius caesar but a lot of people don't know that she had three more children with mark antony because this is not something that tends to find its way into the popular culture representations of her they're more interested in sort of 
the you know the vampy sex kitten than the middle aged mother of four. Um, and so I, I wanted to know, okay, well she she has these three children, so what happens to them? And that was what led me to look at Cleopatra Sweeney, and, and it was quite interesting finding out about her and the things that she went on to do because why don't we know more about her? Why is she not being talked about in the same sort of sentence as her mother, as other uh, Roman client rulers? I mean, we, we, we hear about Herod, you know, all the time we hear about Herod. And at the same time that Herod is doing his thing in um, you know Judea, we, we have Cleopatra Selene and, and her husband Juba doing their thing in Mauritania. And so it just seemed to me that this was a, a really interesting story uh, a new perspective on Cleopatra, on Antony, on the Augustan principle, and you know it was a it was a an interesting angle on a lot of better known, sort of more thoroughly covered areas of Roman history. No, I, absolutely. I think we all know the story of you know, Cleopatra and Antony at least a little, uh, and but we don't hear a lot about you know their children or what happened after. Now, on uh, page 25 in your book, when I was reading, it's written that the Roman imperial family were kind of the influencers of their day. And I thought that was interesting and that Cleopatra Selene must have had some sort of a following of her own. Uh, and today, kind of in contrast, we can see how celebrity influences people. How do you think this following would have impacted Cleopatra Selene and you know, what exactly would her sphere of influence have included? Yeah, I think it's really interesting that, you know, 2000 years later, and there are still so many things that are so very similar. So, you know, we, we have we have ancient royal families and ancient imperial families, and we see people looking to them to set an example. And we, we find them setting trends. You know, we, we know, for example, that uh, um, women, let, let's go with women, um, in, in, in the Roman Empire copied the the you know the hairstyles and the and the clothing and the jewelry and the the beauty remedies of, of uh, members of the imperial family. And so when it comes to Cleopatra Selene, I think we we don't we don't have any sort of explicit evidence for stuff like that. But I, I can I can envisage that when she was growing up in Alexandria People in Alexandria, the you know sort of the the um, Greco-Egyptian elite, would have been looking to Cleopatra and how she was raising her children. You know, the fact that they were being very well educated, for example, that that would have been something that I think people would have would have admired and would have wanted to replicate with with their own children. But it's later on in her life that I think is is we have more tangible evidence of this, and and we see. For example, in the um, the silver hoard from uh, the Villa della Pisanella at Bosco Reale, um, there are, there's sort of over a hundred pieces of silver in this hoard, and the ones that get the most attention are, of course, the ones that depict Augustus and Tiberius and Germanicus in uh, triumphal regalia, triumphal processions. But we also have uh, a representation of Cleopatra Selene from this hoard, and so I think it's it's clear that. People are looking to her in this period for, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe because of, of her Egyptian heritage and the fact that she was a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, she was a princess of Egypt, maybe because of her proximity to the imperial family. You know, she, she after uh, the death of her parents, she was taken into the household of Augustus on the Palatine for five years. She, she was part of that extended family. And maybe even because after that she became queen of Mauritania, and so she she was a sort of an, an internationally famous um, ancient royal, and people are interested. You know, just just as today, uh, we are interested in members of, of the royal family, members of political dynasties. We want to know what they're doing. You know, what what how how they're living, how they're working, how they're studying, what they, what they wear, what they, you know, how they spend their free time. I think we see something quite similar in antiquity. And, and so she was someone who would have been very interesting to people for, for many different reasons, some some positive, perhaps some less positive, but certainly as uh, a, a client queen, a ruler, somebody who was exercising power, who was uh, very cultured, very multicultural, very well educated. This is somebody that that I think people would have been interested in, would have been interested in the trajectory of her life and then sort of seeing what she did. Uh, and uh, yeah, either, either admiring that or, or 
or not, um, as the case may be. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me. She was kind of in a unique situation within Rome, like so close to the imperial family and part of that, but then also being raised in Alexandria, of course, like a bit of an outsider as well. And yeah, do you think that influenced how people saw her or? Yeah, yeah I, I think so, because I mean, in the period where she's in Rome, what well, she she has, she's, 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 a, you know, she is this sort of interesting figure who, yes, she is a member of Ptolemaic dynasty, the now defunct Ptolemaic dynasty, because Rome has, has conquered Egypt and turned it into a province. So she has that, you know, she, she's linked to Alexander the Great and Philip of Macedon and, and Ptolemy Soter and, and all the previous uh, Ptolemies. So that's interesting. But she's also the child of Antony. She, she by her father, although she doesn't legally, you know, she, she can't claim anything, you know, Roman citizenship, anything like that, uh, because that's just not how it works with, with uh, foreign-born uh, children. But at the same time, everybody knew who, who her father was, knew that she was part of this, this uh, ancient uh, Roman family. And so you have those very interesting uh, family trees. And then, you know, you, she's, she's actually in the imperial household. She is, you know, is she, is she a prisoner? Is she an honored guest? Is she uh, being fostered um, to all intents and purposes? So she has this, she occupies this intriguing sort of liminal status. And at the same time that she's doing all of that, Egypt is very much, uh, it's fashionable, it's trendy, it's, it's cool. You know, pe people are decorating their homes with Egyptian motifs. People are building their tombs in the shapes of pyramids. Uh, people are traveling there. Now they can actually travel there because it's, it's a Roman province. So there, there is that interesting aspect to it as well, that, that she... She represents Egypt in in, in a, she you know, she personifies Egypt perhaps uh, to to the Roman elite, and so they they well I, I I do wonder when they when they looked at her what what did they see and what did they think were they were they looking for positive associations or negative ones were they looking at her to see is she like her mother is she like her father is she going to be trouble you know and and. Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's safe to say that she wasn't trouble because if she had been trouble, we'd have heard about it from some ancient source. So she must have acclimatized, uh, played the game, done what was expected of her. And that made her even more interesting in the fact that she, you know, she, she's much, uh, clearly much better behaved than her sort of uh, foster sister, Julia, for example, <laughs> who's constantly getting up to mischief in this same period. Yeah. Um... That's for certain. I think we hear a lot about, quote unquote, troublesome women in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So just the fact that we don't hear about her mm -hmm. can lead us to certain clues about what she was like. Um, so, you know, I think it's fair to say that Cleopatra Selene, she had you know, influence in the ancient world, maybe would have been some kind of a role model to some people, at least in society. But what makes her not just someone we can look for as a historical uh, role model, but maybe in the contemporary world, can we pull from her story? So I think that there are a couple of things, and that first and foremost is the fact that once you 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 find out about her, you realise that there is this whole untold story about girls and women in ancient Rome. You know, we we hear about the ones who misbehaved. We hear about the ones who tried things and failed because then you know um all everything was was as it should have been you know so we, we hear about Boudicca we hear about Zenobia you know they Cleopatra the seventh you know they they tried to take on Rome but because they're women of course they failed and so with with all of that you you get kind of get this sense of oh well women weren't really doing anything they they couldn't do anything they're in a patriarchal society all of the you know political military social roles are taken by men women are just there having babies and that's quite depressing uh, it's quite depressing as a sort of young female student interested in history and ancient history to be sort of essentially told that people like you were, were doing nothing and once you actually start to read through the sources you realize that that's just simply not true there, there are women everywhere and certainly they're not 
um, front and center. They're not, you know, they're not consul. They're not imperator, but they are there. You know, there, there, there are women involved in the planning of the conspiracy to assassinate Julius Caesar, for example. You know, there, there are um, women who, who do very pivotal things or at pivotal points in, in the whole entire history of Rome, sort of from the founding of, of the city through, through the monarchy, through the Republic. And so someone like Cleopatra Cellini, for starters, shows us that not only were women involved sort of behind the scenes, but they were actually front of house as well. I mean, she, she was a client queen. So she, she was somebody who had a very high profile and a very high status um, in her kingdom of Mauritania. She was second only to Juba. They, they, you know, everybody in that kingdom was, was uh, you know, uh, subordinate to her. And we see her wielding her power in that kingdom, which I guess we could talk about later. And I think it's also the from from the sort of I guess the the less less of the sort of political military side of things, but the sort of emotional side of things. She can give us an insight into what struggles um, people at that time had. I mean, she she is somebody who went through a huge amount of, 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 uh, of bereavement and grief. You know, she, she lost her family. She lost her, her kingdom and, and her culture and literally everything she'd ever known up to the age of 10. And this is something that would have been hugely disruptive to her. You know, and, and she had to overcome that in some way and, and clearly as, as as we just said you know we don't hear anything about her misbehaving we don't hear any negative opinions of her any any aspersions cast on her or her morality or anything else so clearly she did adapt and adjust and acclimatize and make things work for her and so i think that's quite interesting too as well that's that's something that you know we we sort of think about um something that that is, is potentially quite inspiring to, to uh, you know, modern people that, that you, you can have such a huge reversal of fortune in just a few years yeah, at, at quite a, a sort of um, um, a fundamental sort of formative age, you know, 10, 15, and, and, and so, on, so on. And I think there's also the aspect of it that perhaps doesn't, again, doesn't get so much discussion in the ancient sources and it's it's it has for a long time not been paid much attention to by scholars either but questions of of race and ethnicity and culture and how, just how multicultural and diverse the roman empire actually was and so i think cleopatra Cini is somebody that a lot of people can look at and previously they might have thought well there's nothing here for me you know that there, there, there are no women here for me there, there are no people of color here for me there there are no people you know, from, from anything approaching uh, the, the kind of place that I'm coming from, why why would I care? And the answer is, well, actually, there are people that are coming, uh, you know, have, have similar experiences to you and, and similar backgrounds to you. We just haven't paid them the attention we should have done to date. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, kind of going back a bit to how much she went through, there is, there's a quote from the book, um, for people who might have it, it's page 117. Uh, and it really impacted me. It helped me understand a bit the trauma that she experienced at such a young age when you think about it. Uh, it says, in the space of just over a week, Cleopatra Selene found herself deprived of both of her parents. And it was not too long before she was deprived of her older uh, half-brothers too. So yeah, in, in a short span of time, she lost so much. Can you speak to maybe why Octavian chose to spare the younger children in this case? Mm, well, firstly, I mean, I think this is something else that we we don't think about because of the nature of the Roman sources. You know, Rome is a society that is very patriarchal, and there is this very specific idea of how men are supposed to behave, and so they they are meant to be very stoic in all senses of the word um you know they're not meant to to lose control of themselves and their emotions and show an excess of any type of feeling and there are plenty of if you read the sources there are plenty of roman men who had similar experiences so if you think about um cicero for example his son 
Um, he lost his sister and her baby in, in childbirth. And then just a few years later, he lost his father, Cicero, his uncle, Quintus, and his cousin, who, who was to all intents and purposes, almost a brother to him in the prescriptions. And so there is someone who, who similarly, you know, during this very tumultuous period of history, where there's civil war, you know, there, there, there's violence, there's murder, there, there's prescription. Um, you know, a lot of people are going through this, but because the sources do not choose to present us the sort of emotional side of things, we often forget this. And so for, for Cleopatra Cellini, you know, we, we, again, we're not really presented with her perspective on things in the sources. We're presented with the Roman perspective, which is, oh, isn't it great that, you know, Octavian has conquered this kingdom and, you know, done away with the, with the, with the troublesome uh, royal family. And the fact that he, he, he does, he executes Caesarian, he executes um, Antillus, he even executes um, Antony's uh, stepson, um, Gaius Scribonius Curio, who to all intents and purposes was raised by Antony because his father had died when he was a baby and he's in Egypt as well. So, you know, he, he is absolutely brutal when it comes to the, the young adult men of this particular family, but he does seemingly spare um, Cleopatra Cellini, Alexander Helios, and Ptolemy Philadelphus, the three younger children. The twins are 10, and Ptolemy Philadelphus is six. And so that's probably got something to do with it. You know, you, you, can, you could make a legitimate argument if you're Octavian that you have to get rid of the older boys because they are essentially in the position that Octavian himself had been in when it came to Julius Caesar. You know, Octavian was in his late teens when Julius Caesar was assassinated. And nobody really expected much of him. And he showed them, you know, he showed them that they underestimated him. He, he, he took his inheritance, the name, the money, the soldiers. And he, he basically, you know, with, with help from Anthony and Agrippa and various other people, he hunted down and, and murdered all the people that had murdered his adopted father. And, and he's, he's on, on course by, by 30 uh, BCE. He's on course to be the, the sole um, ruler of, of the Roman Republic, later the Principate. So he knows full well how um, bereaved young men can be quite dangerous. So, you know, it makes absolute sense that he he would uh, execute Caesarian, he would execute Antillas, he would execute Curio. Mm -hmm. But, you know, <laughs> killing babies is not <laughs> quite the same thing. Maybe not also, yeah. <laughs> this period, he does a lot of horrible stuff, but, you know, at, at this point, you know, I think he can afford to be uh, gracious in, in his victory when it comes to these children, because they are children They're, and they are without resources. They are not Roman, whereas, you know, Antillus was Roman, Curio was Roman. So they could, you know, expect to climb the Cursus Sonorum, hold magistracies and power and everything else. The three Egyptian children can't do that. They, they are foreigners. They may have citizenship, but... You know the, the way that they're presented in the in the sources is as they are outsiders they are foreigners they are not roman and so he doesn't need to be afraid of them or wary of them or apprehensive about what they're going to do because they don't have anything and keeping them alive means that nobody else can claim egypt you know there, there aren't the ptolemaic dynasty is 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 very small by this point it is basically cleopatra and her children there are no uh inconvenient siblings cousins around to to try and claim the throne in the absence of, of cleopatra and caesarean so keeping the children alive means that he can say should anybody attempt to take egypt well hang on you know this this is the royal family and they're in my house they're mine um so it's i think it's it's sensible in in that respect and it's also you know that why throw away something that you can make use of later he there is a long tradition of of rome taking the children of client kings and queens, uh, bringing them to Rome, showing them how great Rome is, uh, so that when they go eventually go home, they'll be loyal to Rome and, and sympathetic to Roman interests. And so he probably has something like this in mind for them. He thinks, yeah, I, I can make use of them. He's a, he's a very clever man. You know, he's, he's very far-sighted in, in comparison to a lot of his peers. And he's, he's also very sort of adaptable. You know, he makes use of opportunities that present themselves to him. So. I think he probably just thought, I'll keep them in my back pocket and, and see what use I can make of them in a few years. And there is the possibility that he did kill the boys later. Um, the sources don't tell us this, and then it sort of seems like something they would tell us. 
And so it's it's sort of assumed that they just simply died. You know, they, they, they came to Rome and like so many other children, um, like members of the imperial family, um, Marcellus dies, um, Gaius and Lucius, they die. Uh, you know, it, it just, it happens. So it seems that they, they died, leaving Cleopatra Lini, the only one left. And that makes her even more valuable and even more useful to him because she she's a woman, so she really isn't a threat to him. She can't, she can't command an army. She can't seriously expect to, to have any uh, possibility of going back to Egypt and taking it away from, from Rome. So she there's only there are only good things that can be done with, with her. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Uh, she would have been very useful for someone in Octavian's position, for sure. Um, can you describe, perhaps, as he's bringing her in, of course, she would be seen as Egyptian, perhaps more than Roman. Uh, what impact would the Roman opinion of Egyptians have had on someone like Cleopatra Selene? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because in in the in this period, sort of from from thirty BCE um, onwards, Rome is really interested in Egypt. Uh, they basically the 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 kingdom, the province gets assets stripped. You know, there there are there are things just just constantly being taken from Egypt and brought to Rome. You know, we there are. Even today, there are obelisks all over the city that, that were brought to Rome in this period. There are uh, Egyptian statues and, and other uh, works of art in all the museum collections. So Rome is really interested in Egypt, in Egyptian things, the art, the architecture, the trade routes that are, are going through Egypt and, and into, the, into the east. And so while on the one hand, there's this very positive idea of Egypt and Egyptian stuff, there's this very negative idea of Egyptians and Egyptian people. And we see that, I mean, even, even before the, the conquest, we, we see that, you know, the Romans are very xenophobic. Right? They, they, they don't have a very high opinion of, of any foreigners, really. And, and so the kind of criticisms that we see of, of Egyptian people are, are fairly, they, they make the same comments about Egyptian people as they make about other uh, Easterners, you know, they're, they're, they're effeminate, they're lazy, they're servile, they're dishonest, they steal things. Uh, Egypt is, is, I suppose, in some respects, it's a bit special in that there, there's this sort of idea that it's, it's the reversal of, of everything else because of the Nile and the way the Nile behaves. The rest of, of the region is seen as being topsy-turvy. So women have a huge amount of power, which is weird. Uh, and so, so Egypt, it, the Egyptian people are, are uh, sort of seen in this in this sort of quite negative way and so Cleopatra Selene is coming into a situation in Rome where on the one hand she's very she's inherently interesting to people because of the sort of the tragic backstory and, and the infamous parentage and that's I think that that would that would have made her interesting that people people would have wanted to know about her they would have wanted to, to sort of get a look at her and, and sort of judge all manner of things about her and at the same time, because she's being brought up in the household of Augustus on the Palatine, she, you know, she's right in the heart of things. She's, she's in the highest status place it's, it's possible to be. So she's not um, occupying the same sort of position as an ordinary Egyptian person would in the, in the eyes of the Romans. And... I think there were, there were really lots of things that were, that were were being sort of thought about simultaneously when when people were looking at her and when when she was moving through um, late first century BCE Rome, you know, and the all the all the Egyptian stuff is is being brought in and displayed publicly. The the city is being rebuilt using the proceeds um, from the uh, Egyptian war. Uh, there are temples to Isis and Serapis. You know, the, the worship of Isis is very popular. Um, so there, there are there are sort of all manner of things that I think people people would have had in mind when they when they were sort of thinking about her and, and looking at her and, and sort of wondering what she was going to do. And I think she had the sort of position where she could be what was necessary at, at any given moment. So when she's presented in the triumph in Octavian's triumph, she is there as a, a member of the defeated royal family. She, she is in um, a procession with a whole lot of Egyptian staff, you know, images of, of Egyptian 
uh, landmarks and sites, you know, the effigy of her mother. Uh, so she she's there very much as a, as a conquered and defeated foe representing Egypt and the Egyptian royal family. But then when she's in Augustus's house on the Palatine, is, is she wearing Egyptian clothing? Is she living like an Egyptian princess? Probably not. She's, she's probably wearing Roman clothing. She's, she's probably being encouraged to um, follow the, the same sort of, uh, of daily trajectory as, as everybody else in the imperial family. You know? So we know that uh, there's, there's this sort of um, very performative uh, Livia and Octavia and all the women of the household are, are sort of weaving um, the clothes because that's what good Roman women do. And so you sort of think, is she doing that sort of thing? Is, is she being encouraged to be as Roman as possible? Or is she, is she um, assimilating herself so that she is, is viewed in a positive way and, and she is able to um, make, make a new life for herself? So, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's something that, that is, is, is quite interesting to, to wonder about. And, and uh, of course, we don't know quite what she's doing in this five-year period but then when she goes to Mauritania, she's clearly very interested in reclaiming her Egyptian identity and using it to, to promote herself and her new dynasty. So whatever she was doing in Rome um, with regard to her, her Egyptian um, side, she's very much um, promoting it as, as, an, as an adult woman with agency in her own kingdom. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it makes me think about how adept she must have been at adapting to new cultures. Because growing up in Egypt and then having to move to Rome and adapt there. And then eventually, of course, she's married to Juba, moves to and has to go to Mauritania and rule there. And while she surely imported her Egyptian heritage as much as possible from what it seems like in reading your book, uh, she also surely must have had to adapt to Mauritanian culture, at least a little. Mm. Uh, how would her life have changed mm. as a result of her marriage to Juba? I think we need to bear in mind that I don't think ancient children had much of a childhood, I mean, as, yeah. not, not as we would recognize it. So um, especially members of, it's, it's the members of the elite that we know the most about because we, we have all the information that, they, that people like Plutarch, for example, wrote about how, this is how you educate children. This is this is how you you raise them, and so we know that that boys and girls were being raised with their future roles as as men and women in in society um, in mind. And this, I think that would be especially true if you were the member of a royal family, because your especially the, the Egyptian royal family, because it's such an ancient kingdom with ancient um, expressions of, of kingship and queenship. And uh, we know that the Ptolemies, they, they had their Greek side, but they also were very um, clear on, on inserting themselves into the Egyptian uh, heritage of, of Egypt. You know, we see it in, in the, in the uh, religious life of, of, of the kingdom. We, we see it in the, in the artwork and, and uh, the documentary evidence, the papyri and, and so on and so forth. And so I think Cleopatra Selene probably had quite a good grounding, actually. So being a member of the Egyptian royal family, so having this, this, this Greek Macedonian side, having this Egyptian side, you know, so, so she, she would have seen her, her mother and her older brother presenting themselves to different um, types of people in, in the kingdom in different ways. You know, we, we know that they, they presented themselves one way to the Greeks, uh, another way to the Egyptians. We know that there there were um, Jewish communities in in Egypt, for example, and we and we know that they had quite a lot to do with uh, with Syria and and um, other other places in the Near East. So we also know that at the same time that Cleopatra was ruling Egypt, um, Amenhotep was ruling uh, Kush to the south. Uh, so you know we we can see that there's a lot of diplomatic activity happening and, and a lot of um, communication between. All these different neighboring uh, kingdoms and dynasties and, and civilizations and so this is quite i think good training for her actually to, to to grow up in a kingdom like this where she has the, you know, this diversity so when she goes to mauritania you know she marries juba he is somebody who is probably about as 
close to her experiences as, as, as someone could possibly be, really, because he, he had the same traje trajectory. He was a member of a North African royal family. His, uh, his father, the king, was defeated. Um, he committed suicide. His, his kingdom was taken and turned into a Roman province. Juba was sent to Rome and brought up uh, Roman, and, and because he was very young, you know, he was, he was, he was a toddler when that happened, he, he wouldn't have had any memory of his, his uh, previous life as an African prince. So he was, and he also um, spent time in Octavia and Antony's household. So, so he was somebody that, you know, had pretty much the exact same experience as Cleopatra Lini, who So the pair of them could sort of understand each other in a way that, that other people around them perhaps could not. And it seems that they did that that worked well for them when it came to ruling the kingdom and presenting uh, a united front regarding what they wanted to do there. So um, the the privileging um, and the promoting of Cleopatra Selene's uh, heritage rather than Juba's. You know, they they named their son Ptolemy after her family. You know, Juba uses. Um, Egyptian stuff in his scholarship. They they import a lot of Egyptian things into their kingdom. They redesign their capital city to look like Alexandria. So, so they're really leaning in to um, her background and all the things that she she can bring with her to this partnership. And so I think that's something that's quite interesting to, to think about how normally in a marriage you'd expect the 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 man and the husband to be the the, the high status partner the 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 one who who sets the agenda and clearly in this particular relationship either we have a complete role reversal in which uh cleopatra Cellini is the one doing all of that or we at least have somebody in uh in in juba who is not so uh, egocentric uh, that he can't see how useful she is. You know, he's 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 not um, he's not marginalizing her and minimizing her. Um, although that's that's what the sort of centuries of scholarship subsequently actually do. They talk about Juba, they talk about Ptolemy, they ignore Cleopatra completely. Even though there's a huge amount of evidence for the, the material culture in, in the kingdom as, as being um, very much concerned with, with her. Yeah, I mean, that's something I was actually going to ask in my next question. And we see um, Roman sources, they don't really highlight Cleopatra Cellini at all. It, but, you know, in your book, you note that she did have influence and particularly in Juba's scholarship. We can see a lot of that. Um, where else can we find evidence of, of this? So we have, so in, in the literary evidence, and this is, I suppose, what classicists pay attention to. If you're, if you're concerned with literature, Greek and Latin, you're looking, you're looking at only one particular type of evidence. Um, you're looking at the the literature from this period, and we have Jube, we have fragments of Juba's scholarship. I mean, he wrote a huge amount, uh, but it does it hasn't survived in, independently. Um, it it ends up being um, excerpted by other people, and so the works themselves fall out of use because they've been used by other people. And so um, there are plenty of fragments of Juba's scholarship, and we can see he was he was very interested in all sorts of things. You know, he was he was quite a a sort of uh, a polymath and 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 uh he so he he did have a very broad range of, of sort of cultural literary historical interests but he was also very interested as i suppose you'd expect in africa um he wrote about libya he wrote about the nile he 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 explored and he wanted to find the source of the nile because he, he also wanted to use that as a way of, sort of laying claim to the African continent, Egypt as, as well. And so there's stuff in his scholarship that it he doesn't specifically come out and say, well, my wife said, but it's, it is stuff that it's probable. I mean, how would he know this? How would he know this information about Alexandria, about Egypt, about the Nile? Well, he's he's got someone living in his in his palace that, that it makes sense to hold him. Uh, <laughs> We also, as sort of removed from that, we have the work of Strabo, the geography of Strabo. And we know that Juba and Strabo were 
um, were friends, they were, were uh, correspondents. And Strabo has information in his geography about Cleopatra VII, about Egypt, about the Ptolemaic dynasty that nobody else has. And so you sort of think, well, where has he got this from? He's got he, he's got this from Juba because you know, he, he cites Juba in, in, in various different places. But where's Juba got this information from? Where are all these anecdotes about the, the Ptolemaic royal family coming from? Who, you know, nobody is left alive from that period uh, except Cleopatra Salini. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of reading, reading between the lines and thinking, well, where is it logical that this information has come from? And logically, it's, it's, it's her. Uh, it has to be her. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So we've got about 20 minutes left in the stream. Just want to remind anyone watching, pop your questions in the chat, and we'll be happy to read them off, display them to be answered. Uh, I'm also going to show up, throw up real quick, quick QR code. We'll leave this up for the rest of the stream. If you're interested in Cleopatra's daughter, definitely scan that QR code either now or afterwards in the um, YouTube recording that will be up. You'll be able to reach this. My next question here. So yeah, I mean, you describe her in your book as kind of a co-ruler more than what we typically see as, say, a king and his consort with these um, relationships. Uh, why do you think her role has not traditionally been described this way, at least with modern historians, uh, as co-ruler with Juba? I think because classics is a very traditional academic discipline and for centuries certain types of people were doing classics and were doing the the translations and the commentaries and the historiography and it's well, it's relatively recently. I mean, if, you, if you think about, you know, when the feminist movement sort of had its had its sort of uh, uh, introduction to, to scholarship in, in the sort of seventies, that was when uh, ac academics started saying, okay, well, let's let's look at different things. You know, we we we've been we've been talking about the you know the men and what the men do for over a thousand years, you know, fifteen hundred years, nearly two thousand years. Let's Think about what were the women doing, and and so from the seventies onwards, you, you know, you see this this, uh, this this change in emphasis, and then and then of course it moves on to to children. You know, that's that's even more recent. What what were children doing? And even more recent than that, you know, in in the case of, of just the last few years, in fact, what were um, people that we would today refer to as, as ethnic minorities, depending on, on where you are in the world? You know, what were they doing? Because of course, in antiquity. They were they weren't ethnic minorities. You know, the, the Roman Empire was an incredibly diverse, multicultural place. You know, the whole of, of North Africa was Roman. You know, the, the the Near East, the Middle East, these were Roman. And so, you know, we 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 need to we we started asking different questions and we started looking in different places for the evidence. And so I think Cleopatra Cellini, in some respects, has been ignored. For two things, or three, I suppose. First, that, that she she was a she was a child, uh, and and people aren't interested in children. Uh, or you know, in in antiquity, they weren't interested in children in writing about children unless something happened in their childhood, which was a sort of harbinger of, of, of great destiny. Uh, so they weren't interested in writing about children. Uh, they weren't interested in writing about women unless the women transgressed in some way and had to be put back in their place. And they also weren't interested in writing about people who were outside of, of the, the sort of traditional um, realm of, of political decision making. So um, in Judea, for example, the only reason we know quite as much as we do about that client kingdom is because of Josephus uh, writing about it later. You know, he's he's. Uh, He's he's taken back to Rome by the Flavians, and he writes all these these texts about Jewish history and and, and Jewish culture, and so he gives us this, this great insight into what's going on in the client kingdom of Judea in the in the late first century BCE. If we didn't have that, we would not know 
anywhere near as much about all the all sort of shenanigans that are happening in the imperial court and the imperial family there. If we had a Josephus from Mauritania, we'd know far more about what was going on in that imperial court or, or any of the other client kingdoms, in fact, because there are so many other client kingdoms in the Near East. And we have to we, we, we have to find like these few fragmentary references to them in Tacitus and, and other other ancient sources writing about Rome. But only when those client kingdoms come onto the Roman radar, so when something's gone wrong. And in those, in, in the places that were once the client kingdoms, you know, the, the archaeological context and things like that, uh, that's where we, we, you know, we, we find material culture and, and artifacts that could be quite useful. But how high profile are those finds? I mean, trying to trying to access uh, museum collections outside of, of um, Europe and North America, you know, European and, and North American museums are, are quite good about putting a lot of their collections online so you can see them. But other other uh, museums are not. And so you, you actually have to go to these places and a lot of these places are not so easily accessible. And so it's not that um, there potentially isn't a huge amount of information that could be brought into mainstream scholarship. It's just that it hasn't happened yet for any number of reasons. And so we find people like Cleopatra Cellini who are very much on the margins in, in, these, in these places. Um, I mean, when it comes to Egypt, the, the main thing that is on display or you know, ends up on display it's the pharaonic stuff yeah. rather than the, the Ptolemaic stuff and the very, very late Ptolemaic stuff. I mean, we, we don't have any um, sort of very many securely identified portraits of Cleopatra the seventh, and she's the most famous Ptolemy of them all. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's a, a question of the, the sort of the, the gaps in the scholarly record, I think. Yeah, for sure. And that's a good point. And it kind of brings me, now to my next question a bit, one of my favorite chapters in the book is it's chapter 12 entitled An African Princess. And I found it to be very timely. Uh, it's something that we talk about a lot today in the current world. It's a matter of race, uh, especially in ancient studies, as it's something that's not always been addressed, especially in regards to Egypt. Uh, so how much do we know about Cleopatra Selene's ethnicity and race, as well as ancient thoughts on racial diversity? Like how would that have played into her life? Well, we can't know anything for certain. I mean, this 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 is the funny thing. Whenever this topic comes up, and it and it comes up fairly regularly. I mean, most most recently yeah. it's come up because there was the Netflix uh, documentary yes. or docudrama, um, Queen Cleopatra. And of course, you have you have the people who who are you know very firmly saying no, she was definitely this, and they're wrong. They're wrong to do that. Uh, we do not know. We do not have the information in the historical or archaeological record to make any definitive identification either about Cleopatra the seventh or about, as a result, Cleopatra Cellini. So what we do know, of course, is that she she is um, half uh, half Ptolemy, half half Roman. Um, so we, we know that she has a mixed heritage in that way, and we know that she marries an African um, Juba, who he was raised in Rome. But um, oh, and, yeah, we don't know who his mother was actually. So so we know that his father was an African king. Uh, we, we don't know um, whether his mother was was an African queen or, or whether she she was Roman. Or, any any other any other sort of uh, heritage, and so we 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 can see the end point. We know that, that Cleopatra Cellini ends up in a in a sort of um, multiracial blended family, um, but that so that that's nice to be able to sort of make make that sort of say that rather definitively. Um, but why why do we even say this? Why do we even make such uh, put such an emphasis on this because this is not something that is ancient. This is this is not something that that ancient people would have necessarily cared about. I mean, they 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 would have they would have cared about uh, the fact that she was Egyptian, and that's the thing. They they see Cleopatra and they see Cleopatra Cellini as Egyptian. They refer to them as Egyptian. So all the people who today 
argue that oh they they were they were ptolemaic they were pure greek macedonian you know well you don't know that for starters we don't the, the ptolemaic family tree is very very spotty um and as far as they were concerned themselves they were egyptian you know or, or they, they were both egyptian and they were they were sort of macedonian um so they they were presenting themselves in in different ways depending on who they were presenting themselves to and so it's a very it's a very modern um thing to try and retrofit onto the ancient world and we you know we obviously people in antiquity they 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 could they could differentiate between you know white skin black skin brown skin but they didn't care about it in the way that our contemporary society cares about it and i think something else that's worth noting in it with regard to sort of current current concerns is the complete um, inability of, of some people to um, accept anybody who is not white as, as high status and especially as royal. And this is something that is, is very, very much in the public eye, has been in the public eye for the last sort of five years or so since uh, Prince Harry um, of, the, of the British royal family married Meghan Markle, uh, you know, a biracial American. And the, the, just the, 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 the sheer amount of, of, of people who just cannot accept um, Meghan Markle as, as a duchess, as a member of the royal family, her children, Archie and Lily, as members of the royal family, and they can, they have all manner of reasons for this. Oh, you know, she's American. She, you know, she's divorced. She's an actress. She doesn't behave in a royal way. Uh, but familiar. <laughs> we, we sort of, as I said earlier on, that we we still see today very similar things when it comes to the royal families. Um, the imperial families, political dynasties, we still see them being judged in remarkably ancient ways. And so I, I thought that was something that was quite interesting while I was researching and writing the book, because one of the one of the issues with Cleopatra and with Cleopatra Cellini that, that both the ancient Romans have uh, and, and we see today is, well, what what is what is a royal woman supposed to look like? How is she supposed to behave? And part of the issue with Cleopatra is, of course, she doesn't behave like a Roman woman, but she's not a Roman woman. So why would she? But she's being judged as as um, as, as a Roman woman and found wanting. And I think that's, that's something that's probably was very much on Cleopatra Cellini's mind, having seen you know, she, she in Augustan Rome, Cleopatra is being called, you know, a whore and a slut and, and a monster and a witch she's hearing all of this you know she's she's seeing her 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 dead mother being denigrated on a daily basis in, in an attempt to sort of prop up um octavian and and uh, that that can't have been uh, a pleasant experience for her but it, it probably did influence her in her behavior that you know she she didn't want to be treated that way and she she needed to move beyond um you know her her infamous mother and then when, when we when we see the coins that she issued in Mauritania, she did refer to her mother on her coinage. So this is not someone who's ashamed of her mother and her mother's achievements. She's using her mother as, as a way of bolstering her own prestige. And she's following in her mother's footsteps in her worship of the goddess Isis and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Looks like we had a comment come in. So I'll read that off. We have a few more minutes. So if anyone else wants to put one on in there, definitely go ahead. Uh, this was from Facebook. Says, I am an Egyptian, and even today, pharaonic history still gets most of the attention mm -hmm. and study. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and speaking speaking as as a British person from the UK, um, it's the Tudors <laughs> of, of all the the thousands of years of, of British history and, and recorded history. You know, we we you know we have we have the 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 Romans and the Celts and, and, you know, all the way through um, all the different um, groups of people that come to Britain, it's the Tudors that get the lion's share of the coverage in every respect, you know, books in the bookshop and, and uh, TV dramas and films and documentaries. It's, you know, if, if, if there's even the slightest Tudor related um, historical 
find or, or, or uh, reinterpretation is all over the the press um so so yes i think every every country probably does have its specific period of history that gets you know in in, in greece i think the you know, classical athens is is preferable to any any other parts of, of uh, um, athenian history for example yeah for sure so let's see i've got one more question i'll ask and then we'll start wrapping up um big picture what is Cleopatra Selene's legacy today? I think she is a way for us to see a different type of Roman Empire. A di you know, there, there were the Roman, the Roman world was a very diverse place. Um, we, we have, you know, the, the different provinces were very diverse, um, you know, never mind the, the uh, empire and the client kingdoms around it. And often the client kingdoms do not get paid much attention to because they, they are just not, you know, people focus on Rome or wherever the emperor is and the empire. They don't focus on the periphery and uh, what's happening on, on these sort of frontier zones unless there's some sort of military issue. And so I think Cleopatra Sweeney is, legacy then is is that she is a way into thinking about the Roman Empire in a different way so we can think about a Roman Empire in which women had power they had agency they had prestige and status um, people of non-Roman backgrounds likewise could could have power and prestige and status and these the the also the the uh the fact that we don't know everything, you know, that, that if you look beyond the sort of canonical literature, uh, you know, the, the, sort of the, the standard historiography, there are other types of evidence that you can look at. You can look at papyri and ostraca, you can look at coins, you can look at small finds, and they will quite often tell you different things, or they will tell you things that are not in the, the sort of the historiography, because well, maybe they're not in the stuff that survives, but but they they were in other histories that, that from the period that didn't survive, and so it's this whatever you think the 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 way things were was whatever you think the sort of the the narrative trajectory of of, of ancient history was, it's not set in stone. If you if you look at something different or if you ask a different question, you might find that actually it goes off in quite a different direction. So she she is she is a sort of poster girl perhaps for a, for a, for a different way of of doing ancient history. Okay, yeah, absolutely, and that makes sense. Um, I do think it's about time to wrap up. I know we said we'd be going until one. So thank you for the wonderful comment that came in and the conversation today. Don't forget to check out Cleopatra's daughter. Uh, and Jane, is there any? social media you'd like to plug? Where can interested people find out more about you and your work? Okay, so um, I have a staff webpage on the University of Glasgow website. That's basically all my academic stuff. Uh, I have social media myself. I have a Twitter feed, um, at JL Draycott. I have an Instagram, Jane.Draycott. I also have a website uh, and it's, but it's very much under construction. I'm sort of gradually uh, populating it with with information about uh, my work. So if you if you search for me online, you'll you'll find me in in uh, various different places. Okay, great, and I put those in the chat as well. I use your social media handles so people can always look there. Uh, all right, and again, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful today, and I'm going to end the live stream. Oh, thank you for having me. Of course. And thank you everyone for watching. Bye-bye.